The night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. What a day. Uh, I had a, a guest by the name of Suzanne Olson scheduled for tonight. And Suzanne Olson... Um, didn't respond to Slick Eddie's emails this morning to set up, you know, details of the show. And uh, so Urgent Pleas went out to her to say, you know, we've got you scheduled. Are you going to be here? Whatever. And she didn't reply. But that actually created a really uh, great, not a great situation, but it created an opportunity for us to have our good friend Britt Griffith. Now, you know that Britt and I are working on a lot of different projects together. Of course, we've got the political show known as the Independence Gang that we're doing together. We've got the, I don't know what you call it, kind of off-color show Friday nights called Booze, Brews, and Bros that we've been doing together. But we really haven't had an opportunity to use this show as an op- as a place to talk about our shared ghost experiences. I've got some. He's got many. And, uh, in fact, he's got some video we're going to talk about, um, some pictures, and we're just going to, uh, you know, maybe tell some stories, whatever it is. It'll be fun to do that. The, um, the nice thing about all of it is that we'll also be able to take your questions. Britt is in the chat room. And Britt spent a great deal of time uh, on the TV show Ghost Hunters, of course, uh, and Ghost Hunters International. So we've got a whole bunch of fun stuff to talk about. Now, I'm using different software tonight, so I don't have my quick keys right at my left fingertips. So you're going to have to excuse my back for a second, but I'm going to uh, bring Britt in here with me. Are you here, Britt? I just want to make sure that I'm doing this properly. Um, I've never been referred to as a treat before. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. I'm not sure I, I, if I said that it was subconsciously, I probably wasn't thinking yeah. about it when I used that word, but I just, the, the thought of you licking on me or something, oh, no. Oh, no. Treat, oh, no. it was just, it was, oh, I, no. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure that out. Now I have to, um, I've got to just, and I should have done this off air ahead of time, but we didn't have enough time. Just remember this show is very, very different than booze, brews and bros and very, very different than our political yeah. show. So we do have some tighter boundaries here, Britt. Um, for anybody who's yeah, seen Brit yeah. in action, he tends not to have a filter. So it, it's always no, like, no. it's often like, you know, either uh, throwing some dice or even sometimes pulling the pin on a hand grenade and seeing how long it, before it blows up. So, uh, no, we should have fun. Oh, i I, I like that analogy, pulling the pin on the hand grenade. <laughs> anyway, so this... you just never know. Yeah, so this... Do you, have, do you have the crazy train racked up? I uh, Actually, the crazy train is part of this because I'm using our setup for the political show as our way to bring you into this. So, yeah, so it's ready to go. Gotcha. Look, at you're not even wearing a T-shirt. <laughs> right. You're, like, all dressed up for this as well. I, wore, I, I put on a collar shirt for you tonight. Wow. Although I will tell you, I got my shipment of political T-shirts in. I cannot wait to wear them on the other show. I yeah. Well, I saw the one you had on last night. By the way, if you're if you're tuning in and you want to join us for the political show, our next broadcast is tomorrow night at nine p.m. Eastern, and the and the uh, the political show is just a serious look at at, at the political news of the day. And if uh, you're politically active or have a political opinion. Uh, you might find it interesting. If you're not on the same side of those political opinions as we, then you might find it a little combative. But we'd take it all with, uh, you know, in, in a good natured way. And as long as you, if you want to argue with us, that's okay too. If you want to, we like that too. Yeah, we do. As long as it's respectful argument, you know, personal insults, yeah. uh, we don't resort to that very often, and we certainly don't accept it those from uh, people in our chat room. So the well, personal arguments will get you banned. Pers- we use personal insults on each other, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, again, this is this is kind of uh, last second, and I'm excited about it because as I started thinking about it, Britt, I'm, I was reminded that we have so many stories together and so many uh, shared experiences. Um, and then you have a whole bunch, too, because you were, you know, all over the place with the team, with TAPS and, and the Ghost Hunters team. Uh, I don't know where we want to start. Uh, let's start a little bit by just getting to know your personal journey. How did you get involved in the paranormal stuff to begin with? How did that start for you? Um, so for me, uh, wow, it's been so long since I've talked about this stuff um, in a format like this. So when I was growing up, my mom and dad got divorced that whole fun time. My dad moved in, you know, 
new wife, stepmom, whatever, they owned a house in Woodbridge, California, which was new construction, actually. That was holy what the hell off the hook haunted. So when I was six, uh, six, uh, 17, 18, 19, somewhere right in that range, that's when they lived there. They were only there 2.77 years. And me, my brother, and my stepbrother, we would walk. Uh, the craziest shit would happen there. Oh, am I allowed to say that word on this show? Uh, Probably it's, not. It's, um, it's, 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 a, it's a foot over the line, but I'll let you get away with it once. Okay. Um, so so uh, we would literally watch uh, just crazy stuff happen. Stuff would move. We would hear sounds. We also had a, lab, a, bla- uh, a yellow lab dog, which is one of the more smarter of the breeds of dogs, apparently. Um, and it was a two-story house, but it was vaulted ceilings. And when you were down in the TV room, living room area, you could see up to where our bedrooms were. And there was like a, a walkway between the two bedrooms that you could see that could look down from the vaulted ceiling and then the steps that would go up to it. And we would be downstairs watching TV, the three of us, and all three of us would watch this like shadowy thing about four and a half, five feet tall, walk back and forth between the rooms. And our dog would stand at the bottom of the stairs and growl looking up it. Oh, wow. So so it wasn't just like one person. It wasn't just me seeing it because then I would just think I was crazy. But, you know, other stuff would happen. And so as you looked up the bedroom, up, up the thing in the hallway, the left side was was my stepbrother's bedroom, and then the right side was my brother and my bedroom when we were there because we we're only there every other weekend. Um, and then underneath that bedroom was my was the master bedroom for my parents. This will all make sense in a second. So, in that bedroom to the right was wall to wall closets, mirrored windows, all top ceiling to ceiling to floor. And within that closet, which was only like a, a standard two, was a two and a half three feet deep closet. You know, hang your clothes and your shoes and whatnot. But there was this little person door behind Mm. where the clothes would be hanging and it would go into this attic area that was all drywall that was very nice with lights in there a switch outlet but it was and it was probably the size of a one car garage but it had kind of slopey ceiling so it had a real funhouse effect that door would never stay shut would never stay shut every damn morning we would get up the door would be would be opened one night, my brother took a wire coat hanger and wrapped it around the pole that you hang your clothes on, stretched out to the door handle, and wrapped it around the door handle. And two days later, that door was open and it was pulled through where he had wrapped it. And it, like, it like gave that spring look as it was mm-hmm. pulled through the door handle, mm-hmm. and it was open. So that kind of crazy stuff would happen. And at the time, we none of us wanted to tell our parents because we thought they would think we were smoking the ganja a little bit or something, and we'd end up in some counseling somewhere. And so we just kept it to ourselves, and that is the uh, God's honest truth. We were afraid that we'd be sent to counseling, so we just shut the hell up. So fast forward about four years ish. It's a Thanksgiving Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving Christmas time. I want to say it was Christmas, but it could have been Thanksgiving. So don't hold me to it. We're at dinner. And we're all sitting around the table. All of us, and, and for some reason, ghost stories came up. Something came up, and I and I made the mistake of and I shouldn't say mistake, but I made I went. Hey, do you guys remember that house on Pinewood? To my my dad and stepmom, and they had all kinds of stories. Oh wow! And they were experiencing stuff. And my stepmom would was telling stories that she would she would be home because she worked off hours. She uh, was in the customer service business for a long time, and she would be uh, home in bed laying sleeping and she would feel our dog pacing at the foot of her bed back and forth and she would kind of kind of look up well, what's going on and the dog would be looking up you know like poltergeist style the dog staring at the wall but would be looking up at the ceiling and pacing and trying to sniff and kind of grunting a little bit and whatnot she told stories where she would literally be at the sink at the sink um doing whatever girls do to their face in the morning you know chisel jackhammers you know paint brushes and stuff but she would like Foundation down, do something, come back, foundation gone. Just like literally that. She would find it days later, like in the back of her underwear drawer where she would never put it. Wow. Um, any kind of any kind of fancy gown dresses, like for going out to the ball type of thing. Um, did your, those did your mom go to a lot of balls? Yes. I don't know what you, I don't know what you call it, but <laughs> she was a, an exec. She was an executive assist, uh, an executive secretary or executive assistant okay. to a really high power dude in Orange County. Okay. So there was a lot of political. I don't. What do you call them? Balls, uh, meetings. I, I but it wasn't know. a meeting. It I wouldn't call them balls. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe they're just more functions. I don't know. 
functions. I don't know. Anyway, all of her nice dresses, she would find them. They'd be knocked to the ground or they would be in a drawer, which she would never put. So anyway, it's all kinds of stories. My dad, my dad they would be home. The kids would be gone because my stepbrother would be at his dad. We'd be at mom's and whatnot. And they, they said, my dad would say it would literally sound like furniture moving upstairs. Like someone would grab the couch and dragged it across the floor. He would grab his gun and go up there thinking someone broke in. Right. Nothing up there. Over, so that was what made me go, what in the hell is that all about? Because we all experienced it. Now, I have gone back to that house, and I did try to investigate that house, but um, they wouldn't bite. They were like, uh, 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 uh. But the house has been bought and sold. This is you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago when I looked this up. Mm -hmm. The house was only like, like 28 years old, but it had been bought and sold like – 18 times it was some crazy amount like that wow a lot of turnover here's the funny side story about nine years later after they had moved my dad was my dad's an avid golfer like we'll, we'll just get his clubs and walk on and join a group he ends up joining a group and it was one of the guys in the group was the guy they sold that house to so the guys my parents sold the house to the 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 the, the, the father about the ninth hole after they got a little alcohol in him golfing, the guy finally leans over to my dad and goes, hey, you know, when when you lived at that house, did you notice anything strange happening upstairs in that little bedroom? And, of course, my dad was like, oh, we didn't know nothing. We didn't sell you a haunted house. We told but even they had problems with it. So and that's why they moved, apparently. So that's what got me into it. Made me, that sparked my interest of what are we dealing with? So a, what is this all about? Yeah. So apart from, you know, doors opening and shat, you know, seeing shadows moving around, did, did you ever feel or anyone in the fa family feel threatened at all at, at any point? Or was it just more of a playful thing? Um, none of us felt threatened. My brother was scared as shit to sleep in the room alone, but, um, but, but I never felt threatened twice. I'm sorry. Who's keeping count? Um, Everybody drink. Oh, wait, that's a different show, too. That's a different um, show. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but no one ever felt threatened and, not, and no violence ever happened. But it was just a lot of activity. Um, and this was new construction, so we don't know what the history was there or what happened in the beginning or what caused it. I mean, that, that whole land was, was was Native American land and was settled. I mean, All right, so I, was it me, literally a poultry? Let me ask you something about that because, you know, often – when I ask people who talk about their either haunting experiences or ghost encounters, whatever it happens to be, frequently, you know, the explanation, well, it was Native American land. What is it about Native American land that, that so many people think that is going to be the source of energy for some type of haunting or spiritual activity? Because I tend to think, you know, people of all cultures and races die. Their souls do all, all do the same thing eventually. And if part of that is being a ghost or whatever, then part of it is being a ghost. But I, but often people go back to, well, it was Native American land, so therefore, you know, that explains the haunting. I, I'm not sure I buy that. What do you think? Um, I would, I, I, well, number one, Native Americans are scary when they're angry, so maybe that's it. Um, but, but more of this. How about, how about this? Uh, I, I, I submit this. So there was a place we investigated that was holy crap. Like some of the best evidence I've ever seen came from this industrial building here in LA. And um, when we did the, there was no reason for it to be as haunted as it was. And when we started doing the research and backtracking, um, when that place was developed, because it used to be, whoa, you just disappeared off the square. It's haunted. Um, I'm here. I'm trying to do this, do this with my left hand over here to change scenes, you know, which I normally do uh, facing the other way. Yeah. So I, I just made an error, but you keep going. Yeah, you just deleted yourself. Um, so this building was built on old oil refinery field, um, ref refinery land. And so there was all that. But when it got sold and it had to be remediated because of all the all of the contaminants from drilling oils for so many years way back when in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, um, they had to do what they call burn the earth. So they had to dig down like 
300 feet, 600 yards wide, 3,000, you know, whatever it was. And as they were digging through, they ran across a, a grave. They ran across mass, a mass grave of, of about 300 bodies. And the reason they know that is because they had to stop the, the process. And then the, then the universities like the La Brea, La Brea Tar Pits came in, University of USC came in, UCLA, some others from around. the, And they totally excavated this entire thing. And it was probably 300-ish plus years ago, maybe 400. Um, but it was like they think maybe when the Spaniards came through, they totally slaughtered this tribe and then just mass buried them and then covered it up. Um, and I don't know how the how the bones people do this. The uh, anthro- anthropologists, is that what they're called? The, the bones people. They would be archaeologists, okay. maybe, or paleontologists, yeah. or maybe it's paleo. It, it was more about the bones people, not the. But the, the way they could tell is they said that it looked like some of them were buried alive. I don't know how they could tell that, but that's what that's what, what is in this legitimate articles and documentation from the L.A. Times, uh, the USC uh, uh, historical records of the area. Um, so we found this up. So my point to you is. Is that when people go, eh, eh, it's Native American land, maybe that's what the problem is. The point is, is is maybe you were built on top of a grave where there's now unsettled souls because it's been desecrated. You know, Native Americans used wood. Okay. How long does that wood markers last? Okay. So maybe it's something like that. It's not that it's not so, that they're special. Okay. So so then what um, you're saying, if I could just kind of translate that and boil it down a little bit, you're saying that because uh, a lot of a lot of areas are former Native American burial grounds that are unmarked, we don't really have you know, any evidence of what they were, as opposed to our, what we would call our cemeteries, our Christian burial grounds, which are very well marked. We know where they are. We're not building houses on them unless you're in the movie Poltergeist. Um, so is that kind of what you're saying? Because those lands aren't necessarily respected, not marked, and we could be building on them, that kind of thing? I, that's what I'm, I mean. You ask for a plausible yeah, no, possibility that's, or yeah. plausible. That's, that, I mean, that would make sense. I mean, because you're right. They, we're all humans. I mean, we're all made from the same energy. So why would they be any more active than, you know, the the the, the, the Irish tribe up in the, the, the northern lands? First, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. why would they be any more? Although on the flip side, they're very spiritual people, and then there are some people that are not. Does that have anything to do with it? Like when I, you check and out, that, I don't know. I th- I think the argument gets a little thinner there. I liked your first explanation. I think the spirituality yeah. of Native Americans versus the spirituality of everyone else. I think there are pockets within every community that are very spiritual, and then there are pockets that aren't very spiritual within every community, within every culture, within every race. So I have to say that I like your first explanation better. But let's go back to your tr- your path here. You. You had these experiences as a, as a child. You lived in a home that um, that had some pretty cool activity going on. It developed this curiosity to you in you. About when was that? About year wise, when was that? Like was that in early nineties? When uh, when I was uh, uh, let's see, seventeen. I graduated eighty eight. So yeah, it was late eighties. Late eighties. Okay. Was, uh, that house. Okay, so yeah, this this was this was obviously you know still uh, fifteen years ahead of uh, you know a TV show like Ghost Hunters appearing. So what oh, God, did, yeah. so what did you do at that point? Did you because you know what I find in talking to people who had this interest predating Ghost Hunters, you know there weren't many outlets for it. There weren't many ways that you could actually go and uh, and talk to other people. There wasn't an internet that was no. really accessible. Talk to other people that had similar interests. You might be able to go get a book about ghost stories from the library. Or you could, you know, get with a bunch of friends like I did and you can go to the cemetery and sit around and, and you know, spook yeah. each other with stories, whatever it happens to be. What did you do? Well, I mean, I've watched a lot of In Search Of. Yeah, me too. You know, that, those kind of shows. Um, but, you know, I, I, when I turned 18, I mean, I didn't go to college, so I didn't get that fun ride. I had to start working, so I got a job. I moved out. It became – what does that mean? <laughs> I was just showing – I was showing folks my list of questions. Oh my god! For you actually have questions for of me. Of course I do. I prepare for you these shows. Me. You should have this off the top of your head. Oh, you know what? I could answer. I can answer all your questions for you because I've heard the yeah, answer exactly. so many times. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh my god! So you just do it. Um, no, I uh, basically when I turned eighteen, I moved out of I moved out of the house. And I got a job, and it was about making rent, buying beer, and finding chicks. Mm-hmm. And and I got away from it. I just I just you know because. You know, there wasn't there. There was no ghost hunters to go. Oh, I can do that. Right. This is a possibility. Right. I did. We 
because you know we weren't saying anything at that because it was still a couple of years later before that that Thanksgiving thing happened where we talked about it. Yeah. So you know we didn't. Of course we. I mean, and, and the three of us were like, we ain't telling nobody about this because we'll end up in counseling, or of some sort. So we just kept it to ourselves. But you know, and then I got older, and this was two years, uh, about a year and a half before Ghost Hunters aired. For the first season, uh, I was at some party, a work party, work function thing. And for some reason, we were telling ghost stories. And I told my ghost story that I just told you. And uh, this guy who had an organized team in San Diego was part, you know, he was within the company just down in San Diego. He was like, hey, you know, you might be able to be, you, would you be interested in this? This is what we do. And basically, they would go do what Ghost Hunters does, you know, help people, whatnot. You know, you have this experience with it. You're not afraid of it. You might be able to help us. So um, I said, yeah, hell, that sounds like fun. Why not? So uh, so I did it. And that's how I ended up on an organized team. Mm. And uh, it was just a fluke. And then I was doing it, having fun. I ended up buying an ambulance and made it a ghost mobile out of it and whatnot. And, but, uh, and then when Ghost Hunters came on the air, I saw that. And I remember, I remember watching the first episode. And at the time I was married and I looked over at my now ex-wife and I said, wow, this is the first ghost show I think I can actually watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had the same yeah. reaction. But, uh, but yeah, but that's how I ended up on an organized team, which was before Ghost Hunters was even on the air. And I was like deep into it. And, you know, and again, 99.99999% of the time we were able to debunk all this stuff. It was, but I also found that a lot of it was just therapy for people to be able to talk about, hey, this is what's going on in my house. You know, my door opens and slides on its own. Well, I'm just making something up right now. Opens and slides on its own and that light switch keeps going on. And then we would go check it out. And, oh, you know, ma'am, your your door is not even and it's actually loose. And when a big truck goes by, we figured out that this shifts and your door will slide open. Yeah. Uh, and you just need a new light switch. We went ahead and changed that for you. And to them, it was like, it's like we gave them back their castle. Because to them, it was like, oh, I'm not crazy. I was experiencing this, they experienced it, and now they have an answer for me, and I can put this all to bed. And we would literally give people back their castles. And what I found also was with the places where they would say, hey, X, Y, and Z is happening, and then we would experience X, Y, and Z and have no damn clue as to what it was. We would tell them, hey, what you told us, we experienced, and we don't know why. Same reaction, though. Oh, my God, I'm not crazy. Thank God you guys experienced this. And it's like they're at, they're at ease with that. It's like we gave them back, okay, I'm not crazy. Now, how do I deal with this? And it was easier for them to deal with it, knowing that they weren't crazy. How Even much? Yeah. How much is the uh, of the process and the relief from people, whether it was while you were doing cases, you know, pre ghost hunters or during the investigations on ghost hunters, which are a little bit different. But how much of of the end result was just a, a you know a sigh of relief by the client because, as you just put it, they finally say, "Wow, I'm not crazy." Yeah. Well, number one, the reason that I took it so seriously is early on, we were doing this case down in Calabasas and this is a big house. And the wife with the husband standing right there told us at the foot of their driveway, depending on what you find and what you tell us is whether we sell this place or not. Oh, wow. And of course, in my head, I'm like going, oh my God, you're going to make a life, major life financial decision on what we say, <laughs> looking for ghosts. <laughs> But they were that racked out on it. And we experienced some of the stuff that they were talking about with no logical explanation of what it is or what it was. And we told them, and that, 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 we laid it all out. This, that, that, that's not this, that's that. This is, but this, we don't know what this is. But, and once we confirmed it for him, number one, she looked at her husband and said, see, I'm not crazy. And then they lived there another five years. They were, she was fine with it. It was all in her. She was working herself up, thinking it was a demon. Was I mean, that, whatever. You, ha you have to admit, um, obviously, some of these things can be a little disturbing. You have these experiences. You can be frightened. You can be startled. You can be concerned. You can be whatever. There are a whole bunch of different emotions that can be generated by having some of these experiences. But in all honesty, with the exception of a few scratches that I've seen on people, and maybe, maybe somebody's been pushed down or something like that, the, the actual uh, number of people who have been injured or seriously harmed by one of these hauntings or encounters or whatever happens, it's pretty low. It's pretty rare. Yeah, very rare. Um, the, the craziest, most insane thing I... Let me back up. 
Hold on, hold on. Before you do that, let me just answer a question in in our chat room here. Android is asking what state your house was in because he missed the beginning. Um, It's California, Android. Uh, That's where uh, Britt grew up. So, okay, go ahead. Yeah, California, Southern California, Irvine specifically. The Woodbridge community, if you want to get that particular. Um, So the second most craziest thing I've ever experienced was the it, it, you you can watch it it was on the it was on freaking ghost ghost hunters oops excuse me a little hiccup i'm not drunk i swear um and it's the old city jail in tennessee when our producer uh hagar got was getting scratched was getting attacked by something and adam and i were literally watching these welt scratches to show up on her on her back on her arms it was that was crazy yeah and the evidence we got out of that place was also insane outside of that um but the some of the most craziest thing, and thing I probably the most craziest thing I've ever experienced, and I, you may have been there for this JV. I can't remember exactly, but it was at the Stanley Hotel, and it was with like it was with Grant and Rihanna and Chris Fleming and Frank Sumption was there, I believe. Um, obviously, Jay was there, but he wasn't there at this particular thing. And then there were some other. There was a couple other people out there with the convention. I can't remember if you were there or not, but we went down past the carriage house. Yes, to where. You remember that area where no one got to go? I do remember and that Frank specific. Sumption. I've told the story on this program before about this. Yes, keep going. Oh, um, and Frank Sumption had that had at his box. This was the night that I became a believer in the. I shouldn't say a believer, but I went from the ghost box or the Frank Sumption uh, box. Frank Sumption box. I used to think it was just a doormat. You know, right. It was garbage put in the trash. Um, and that, when we went down there with Chris and all them, it was weird. It was crazy. I mean, literally a two by four got thrown off. Uh, this pile pile of two by fours. Rihanna got attacked or possessed or something. Something happened where it was coming after, and she was losing. The, my 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 name, my full name came o- came over the damn box. Britt Griffith. That's not a short name to say. To get, and how many frequencies did that thing jump? in the span of saying my name because I was going to say ain't working and it spits out my name. That was probably some of the most craziest thing I've ever experienced with my name coming out of that two by fours flying Rihanna being attacked. We saw, um, we saw the, shadow figures kind of shadow. surrounding us that night too. Remember they were That's kind right. of all around oh us. God, yeah. and we, I mean, it was really quite freaky and I, I, I tried to talk about, you know, things not hurting and you know, whatever, and being all brave and stuff. But that was one of the freakier nights. We had those things surrounding us while all that you, that you just described happened. Remember it was inside the the shadow was inside that old school truck, that old whatever that yeah. that truck they were rehabbing, that, that like nineteen thirty something because it had the round top, but it was like in it was like sitting inside the truck. But if I remember now Chris Fleming was saying was was saying that uh it was a uh, because that was the area where they used to torture the Native Americans. I mean, there were there were there were hangings in that. I don't and I don't remember if it was in the building specifically or on the land that the building sat on. I don't remember, but yeah, hangings and torture where they would they would uh, keep um, Native Americans hostage and and do some despicable things to them or you know even it was execute also them. the it was also the area that they stored the dead bodies from TV because that that started as a TV hospital. That's why it was built because uh, uh, Stanley Steamer had TV. Um, and, you know, back in the day, sometimes you weren't exactly dead when they thought you were dead and sent you down there. So That's right. how many people were down there and didn't expect, you know, that that was a crazy night. The, you're right. I, I totally forgot about those those shadowy things circling us and getting closer and closer. That was a freaky night. That whole weekend at the Stanley was quite a uh a great weekend as far as activity went. I mean, we've been there at the Stanley, you know, many times and that was probably one of the best as far as the number of things that happened throughout the course of the weekend. Was that the same weekend with the being up in the room with the, the table jumping? I, I believe so. Yeah. No, yeah. yes, it was. I think it was. You know, do you want me to play it and see if that works? Cause I actually found that. Oh yeah. So yeah. Those, love, yeah, absolutely. So, so when JV asked me to come on the show like eight minutes before the show, um, <laughs> that's actually, that's a little exaggerated, but 15. so I was like, what, what am I going to talk about? So I scrambled and I pulled out an old hard drive that I had and it, it has a bunch of just random evidence that I've collected over the years from being on ghost stars. When I, and I, I ran across this video and, and I don't know if it's going to play right. We'll see what happens, but JV's in this with me. We're at the Stanley hotel and it's me and Amy sitting at the table that jumped when on the show, when, when the guys did that 
the, those episodes there. This is the room and the table that jumped on Grant and made the cameraman scream. Um, Amy and I are sitting at it, and hopefully this will work. Okay, here we go. Can you hear that at all, JV? I don't hear any audio. So that's uh, Amy and Grant up there on that table, right? Nope, that's me and Amy. Oh, that's you Amy and Amy. And I. Okay. Oh, Grant's right there next to I think I was next to Grant there in the left. So can you hear any of that? No, I can't hear any audio from it. Uh, all right, so basically what's hap what happened here is Amy and I were, 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 were touching the table, and it moved on us. And we're like, what the hell? This is not the show. This is just us there. Uh, that head you see moving in the lower left, that's JV's head going back and forth. He had a haircut then, so that's why you can't recognize it. <laughs> I did. I had a really nice haircut back then. Yeah, and then uh, and then that's uh, and then that's Rianne. I'm really bummed that the, the audio is not working. This is before Amy uh, was, was a part of the show too. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. She was like the. That's me. That's my head right there. That's uh, yeah. she. She was like the. Um, like the the uh, producer for the for the uh, Jay and Grant's old radio show or something at the time. Oh, that's right. Well, that's a bummer that the audio was not coming through. Because what happened there is that table moved on us, and then obviously we're all engaged. Hey, and you're like, hey, flip the table over, flip, you know, do something. And then there was a bang right next to Rihanna, and she yeah. lets out the loudest sh s word. Yeah. Um, and she starts going, "I need someone to hold on to. I need someone to hold on to." Because it was like right next to her. It was insane. Um. Oh, what a bummer that, that that didn't work. Well, I mean, um, we still got to see the images. It was pretty cool. But uh, I do remember that night specifically. And that was the same weekend as the uh, the other uh, event we just described, right? I'm pretty sure it was. I, th I think it was. No, it was, that was an insane weekend. Wasn't that also the weekend that in the in the music hall that uh, down in the, the piano, downstairs uh, started playing? Yeah, downstairs started yep. playing and there was no one down there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that was a fun time. That was a crazy yeah. weekend. And if I remember correctly... It's coming back to me now. It was warm. A lot of the wind was kind of blowing. There was a lot of static electricity in the air. It was very dry. Mm -hmm. So maybe that had something to do with the the harness or whatever. I don't know. However, however they the ghosty world does that. Um. Anyway, yeah, Stanley Hotel is a great place. Now they're not into ghosts no more. Yeah, because uh, you know it's it's weird because after it was featured on the on Ghost Hunters, it was revived because the Stanley was about to shutter; they were about to close down. Yeah, and the yeah. Uh, and fe being featured on Ghost Hunters now, of course, for those of you who don't know, the Stanley Hotel, um, in addition to being up in the Rocky Mountains outside of Denver, was the place where Stephen King got the inspiration for to write The Shining, and it's because he had. He had stayed there when it was closed down. He, you know, it was it was shut for the season, but he, they allowed him to stay there, and he had some very strange experiences, and so therefore he wrote The Shining based on it, um, which is pretty and cool. Pet Cemetery, and Pet Cemetery. That's right. Yeah, yeah, because they have a Pet Cemetery there. Not that he had any experiences with it, just in his whacked head. Yeah, he saw that. And goes, oh, I can write a book about that. Yeah, um, and he did, and, and he did. So let's. I mean, since we're on this vein, let's talk about some of the other cool place oh let me you know let me share something here i just i just found this um this was was you me grant and jason at lilydale okay look how young we were <laughs> i know it's scary isn't it <laughs> it was like 12 years ago holy hey, god what the hell is 50. it with uh why? Why are the? Why is the ghost hunter crew all wearing the same damn shirt i don't know it's kind of weird i'm i'm the only one with was a that collar uniform? on uh, uh, no, I mean well, that's because you're the serious businessman. I guess that's what it was. Um, but uh, this was probably 2007 or eight. So what, 13 years ago, 14 years ago? Oh my god, that's a good one. That's a good time. Yeah, and then there's this one. This was Yumi, um, Jason, and actually that's Serena Vincent and Betsy Rue actresses. This was at the first Scaricon. <laughs> I do remember that. Remember? Oh that. my god. Uh, I do have gray hair though there, so oh, so do I. Yeah, this is uh, and this one is that you and me at an event in um, Minneapolis before they burned it down. 
<laughs> yeah, just true. That's right, because that was that coffin that 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 that, that particular room had that coffin that the girl was inside of, and you gave her dollar bills through the thing for being in there. That's right. Yep. That the coffin was the bar, and then there was a girl in there. The coffin was the bar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, she was she had bloody clothes on, but yeah. still. Yeah. Oh, that, that was cool. That was a that was a hell of a party. Um. Uh, they don't do that don't anymore either. Happening. They don't do that anymore. So no. all the things that we used to enjoy have been stopped, which uh, I don't know if it's if there's any correlation with you and I having been there that makes them stop. I don't know. Um, uh, let's, maybe. Let's talk about some other locations, some other things that um, that you remember, uh, you know, as highlights maybe of of your investigations, whether they were with ghost hunters or not. I know you've done a buff. Like, did, didn't you do some stuff at Wolf Manor or something? Oh, my God. Yeah, Wolf Manor, which was Clovis Sanitarium, which is originally Clovis Sanitarium. Yeah, that was uh, that place was weird. Um, horrible, horrible ratings when it was a sanitarium. Lots of abuse and uh, very uh, painful, slow, painful endings of life for quite a few elderly people when it was uh, the sanitarium, unfortunately. Um yeah, Todd Wolf owned it, so he named it Wolf Manor after himself. Mm-hmm. And uh, he tried to, he made it a haunted house and whatnot. Uh, but his, he wanted to re- refurbish it to what it originally was, but then it eventually caught fire and burnt down. But a lot of amazing activity there. Um, the induction, the induction amplifier was perfected there, um, and that's when. The first time I ever heard it actually talk was there in the basement. That was insane. Don't know exactly what it was, hmm. but we have a question um, again from our uh, chat room. Do you believe, Britt, that atmospheric com- conditions can make paranormal activity more active? You just just mentioned, you know, a lot of static electricity in the air because <clears throat> of dry conditions, whatever. So I would have to assume that the answer is yes. But if you know, maybe you can explain or maybe expand upon those ideas. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, y- yes. The, the short answer is yes. I mean, when we find a place that has a lot of activity, it tends to have high EMF or uh, a lot of kinetic electri- kinetic energy that's going on, like like railroad tracks. For some reason, there is activity. There's a higher percentage of activity. It's small, but it seems like there's a lot of claims around railroad tracks that are active. And if you think about it, all the electricity, all that moving gear and stuff going by, I don't know. If the, if the theory is true that we kind of run with that the ghosty world, the, the spirit world harnesses energy out of the atmosphere somehow, um, yeah, anything that would make the, the atmosphere more energetic, dryness, static electricity, high EMF, um, and of course, so, so wa- yeah. water running is always something that seems to yeah. generate some, you know, you know, when you say water running like a stream or, you know, groundwater moving under a building or something like that, uh, it seems to add to the yeah. activity, right? But just, to, but just to be clear, I don't necessarily believe in ghosts as, you know, grandma hanging out, you know, Uncle Fred didn't cross over properly. I don't know what we're dealing with. It, you know, is it a human spirit sticking around or is it just some other life form where sharing this planet on is it aliens observing okay, us all right Brett, hang on hang on you can't just throw that out there as an aside we have to talk about this uh there are a lot of different theories about ghostly activity or what people report as ghosts one of them is as you put put it uh, you know grandma's spirit hanging out after she passed away that, no. that's that's kind of the more traditional uh, view or definition of ghosts uh, however there are more recent theories that talk about interdimensional beings talk about time uh, time slips and time uh, intersections, you know, the past or the future kind of overlapping with our present time. And we're seeing things, you know, through a, a thinning of a veil of some kind. Uh, so there are a lot of different ideas and some people even connect alien activity to what we call yeah. ghosts. So where do you fall in all that? Um, I, my, my honest, my, my opinion right now is we do not have enough evidence to prove that ghosts defined as grandma not crossing over properly, human spirits sticking around to either prove it or disprove it. I have seen stuff I cannot explain. And there's what like there's like five ish, maybe seven ish 
plausible explanations other than grandma not crossing over properly, like the the whole time war, the uh, time bending over on itself, uh, time travelers, uh, aliens observing us. I'm telling you, if if I was like 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 the Vulcans and I was able to travel and observe uh, other life forms, I mean, I had I don't know about you, JV, but I had ant farms when I was a kid. Did yeah, you? I did too. Yeah. Were you watching? Yep. And what, when they were done building their home, what was the first thing we did? I mean, Tapped on that damn glass. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I used to raise armies of ants and then take them out to other ants and and make them take over. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> but but I would I would so if I was if I was observing it, I would screw with them. What if we're just being screwed with? I mean, the other thing is the, the whole harmonics thing. The frequency. I mean, the only reason that I can sit on this chair, you can touch that mic and move it, is that we're all vibrating at the same speed, at the same frequency. So we're all in. But what if there's just another life form on this planet that's a, a couple frequencies off and we just pass through each other like because we're, we're off frequency. We don't see each other and we're kind of just sharing this planet. And every now and then something glitches, the matrix glitches. Let me ask you this, JB. Have you ever been walking or doing something and it's like you tripped over nothing? It's like, what the? What did I just stumble? There was nothing there. First of all, let me say well, thank you for refrain, refraining your language there because you, you caught yourself. That was nice. Um, <laughs> and the answer is yes, of course, I've done that. And, and it's the same thing with not just tripping over things, but seeing things out of the corner of your eye, whatever it happens to be. You're sure there's something there and you turn and it's not really there. Right. So what if what if you the, the harmonic frequency matrix glitched a little bit and you just kicked a chair in someone else's world and now they're freaking out because they think they have a poltergeist that launched a chair across their kitchen floor and you just tripped for no reason. I mean, it's plausible. Sure, is it possible? I, Probably not. Sure, is it plausible? Sure. Those are those are very compelling uh, ideas. However, um, you know, a lot but, of personal ghost experiences. People who come to whether it's you or me. I mean, I've had so many people tell me their stories. They're very specific in a lot of these stories, where they say, "My mother appeared to me, and my mother said to me this." You know, or they have an EVP that's very direct and they say, my name's Bill from, you know, and I died here in 1821. Or, you know, these are very, very specific experiences that people have that I don't think can be explained by some of these other ideas. No, I agree. That's why I'm saying, that's why I'm saying I'm not, I'm not 100% either way. I don't think we have enough either way. I think we still have more to do. I mean, I mean, the reality is until someone can die, go across, get the book for the recently departed and come back with it. We're really not going to know. Yeah. There's just some weird shit that goes on in life that we are not to understand, apparently. Well, what do you think about yeah. what do you think about some of the uh, what we would call equipment that people use? I mean, over the course of your time with Ghost Hunters and even since then, there's been a lot of new equipment introduced to the field. Uh, people get excited about it, but I don't ever really any see see any real conclusive evidence coming from this that we weren't getting with just our standard video and audio recorders in the past? Well, I look at uh, equipment is just to monitor the environment. Our environment has some constants. The barometric pressure stays steady unless you have a hurricane going overhead or a tornado. But I hope you would notice that, you know, temperatures don't go up and down drastically unless the air conditioning kicks on. But I hope you would notice that if you're investigating, you know, the EMF field is actually pretty damn steady. It's not it doesn't fluctuate unless some piece of equipment kicks on or, you know, you have an earthquake in it, you know. But I hope you would notice that when you're investigating. So all the equipment does is it's just monitoring the environment. And for whatever reason, when this activity happens, like when an EVP is generated or a chair moves a little bit or we see the shadow, for whatever reason, the environment goes into flux. The temperature drops, the EMF spikes. Um, and I have evidence of that. I mean, that we have seen that I've documented. Um, so the equipment just helps you solidify that something weird is going on i got this ev there's there's a great uh, ghost hunters when we did the uh i was with chris williams we were up in nevada at the the hotel um that the ghost adventure guys did where the brick was supposedly thrown at them uh the goldfield the gold, hotel. yeah goldfield hotel so chris and i are in the room where the lady was chained to the radiator and whatnot and and what people don't realize and the show didn't necessarily show that well is that when i would go into a room 
because I was on a show with a big budget, I had like 28 recorders that I could use. I had 19 K2s that I could use. I had, I had lots of stuff and I would spread it out like a net. And there's a scene that if you go to the Gofield Hotel episode and watch it, the K2 flickered. And the K2 was next to the recorder that had an EVP on it. That's where, where did the bitch go? Uh, you know, uh, all that stuff that happened around Chris Williams when I had left the room. But a lot of that stuff happened when that K2 flickered. And I noticed it. I made a comment, oh, the K2 flickered. What people don't realize is that the K2, that, that flickered, was kind of in the middle of the room. And there were other K2s around it and other recorders around it. And it was only that K2 and that recorder that had the activity and the K2 monitored it. So that told me there was a fluctuation in the EMF field, the range that the K2 covers. I used to know what this was offhand. I don't know anymore, but whatever that range was that the K2 covered covers in the EMF field, it went into flux and then there was an EVP on that recorder. So there's something to it. So all the equipment does is it gives you something to clue on. Like the rim pods that have all the flashy lights that make the noise, you set it down, you walk away from it. You don't have because it makes noise. You don't have to like stare at it. You can be over here doing this and whatnot. And then, oh, I better pay attention. What's going on over here? And then you turn around and pay attention. I can't tell you how many times that equipment helped me. Oh, God, I got you. Got to see a shadow. I got to see something happen with my own eyes, which is the which is what we really want. We want to experience it. The K two just the the equipment just helps you get to that point, and it also just until we can you know install a USB download port in our head. Everything we have is just a personal experience. You have right. to believe me that I'm telling the truth. But if I can point to video of the rim pod going off, the K2 flickering, and that door moving because I had it all on video, that makes it a much more profound piece of evidence. What about things like mind. yeah? What about things like uh, you mentioned that you know our, our our experience with the ghost box? I've also seen people using the ghost box, which I you know I, I have I, I I call uh, foul on some of the things that you know yes. they were saying we've been in some of these sessions where clear, people are clearly manipulating it but that's just part of the yeah. business i guess um but what about things like the, you know the full spectrum camera or some of these more high-tech things or particularly phone apps they drive me crazy but what do you think of the phone apps <laughs> well okay so think about it jv this is a pretty powerful computer in our hands it's true i mean it really is it's a powerful piece of equipment um and again if it's if whatever is being used for like doing an EVP session, of course, I'm always a believer. You set it down, hit record, and you step away so you're not touching it. And you get EVP on it. You get EVP on it. I mean, it's it's useful. Okay, so but, let me disagree yeah. with you. Let me agree with you. If you use the you know the the the, the camera for video or still photography or you use the audio recorder on your phone, it's just it's the same thing as basically using a standalone audio or video right. recorder. So I have no problem with that. But there are some of these apps that, you know, have a little radar, ghost radar thing, and they have little dots moving around. Those are the ghosts in the room. I mean, if there was something in my iPhone that could that could identify a ghost, then bravo Steve Jobs. Bravo Apple yeah, computer, okay, right? <laughs> yeah, I I, I you know, the, um, Jay made that had that app made yeah. uh, that he called the Haas app, um, and it was legit because there is a. I mean, it was a recorder, perfect. You could put notes on it, perfect. You could take photos with it, perfect. And it it sensed vibrations, which that kind of equipment is within the phone, the gyro, whatever the hell it is, to tell you which way you're leaning and whatnot for playing your games. Um, you know, as long as you're using it for that. It's perfect. Those right. apps are, are bueno. Right. But you're right. If it's like, hey, I'm looking for a ghost. Like, like, what was it with the Pokemon game? You're running around looking for the Pokemon, you know, looking for the ghost. You know, th that's all a bunch of BS. Yeah. In my book. Or what about the, but, what's but the, the, what's the one that uh, comes up with the words? Uh, is it Ovulus? Uh, Ovulus. Yeah. Ovulus. So. I used to think the Ovulus was a crock of shit right along with the Frank Sumption box. And I used to talk a lot of shit of stuff about him back in the day. Before I had that experience at the Stanley Hotel, which made me believe right. in the damn spitter box. Right. But uh, but I used to trash. Uh, oh, my God. I'm forgetting the guy's name who made the Ovulus. The original guy who made the Ovulus. Guy, it's been so long since I've done this talk. These talks. Do you remember who the guy was that invented the Ovulus? I do. Ah, I can see and him. And I can see him in. I can see him. Yeah. And I had gray hair. And uh, yeah. I'm not coming up with his name. 
So anyway, I, yeah, I, I used, but I used to trash it, and then I, and then someone one day told me, he goes, you know, if you're gonna talk, if you're gonna trash this stuff, you should at least watch this video where he talks about it. So I was like, okay, fair enough. Email me the link, and they did. This is when YouTube was just becoming a thing, and uh, so I, I watched it. It turns out that he, are you looking it up right now? I'm trying to, Please yeah. Please look it up, yeah, because it's gonna kill me. Um, yeah. It turns out he, he Bill Chapel, Frank. Bill Chapel, that's it. Yep. Yes, Bill Chapel. <laughs> Dang. Oh my God. It turns out he and Frank were friends. And in this video, he's trashing his own ovulus. And he said, if Frank, if, if Frank could make this magic eight ball box, I can make one. Well, watch this. And that's where his inspiration came. And he tells a story about when he was developing it before it was in the nice box and where it's at now. And he had his computer. He's at Waverly. I want to say it was Waverly. And he had the, the probes put out and he had his hundred word dictionary and it started saying words in it that it started saying words that were not in the dictionary. And that's what made him go, what, what is this all about? And then, um, and then it got stuck on priest, priest, priest. So he was okay. So we must be stuck at this because the way the, the way the obvious works is if the EMF field, the ghosty world is supposed to dive into it. If the EMF is fluctuated to this, it'll say this word. If you move it, if you fluctuate it to this, it'll it'll uh, say this word or that word. It depends on where it's at. It's like a hundred word dictionary in the original one and a hundred spots. And that was the theory behind it. So it kept saying priest. So he he said that he was like, okay. I'm going to, it must be stuck. There's a weird glitch here. So he went in and he, and, I'm, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but he says priest was at two milligas. So he pulled it out and dropped it down to 10 milligas and took the word that was a 10 milligas candlestick and put it in two milligas, thinking that he would start getting candlestick, candlestick, candlestick. He didn't. He got priest again, priest, priest. And then it added a word that it didn't even need. Uh, it didn't, it wasn't even in there, which was need, need priest, need priest, okay. need priest. So and okay. back so, up, back up for me so, here. Yeah. Were you there for this? I don't. No, this is just a story that he's. This telling is the story he's telling, him, and he and he's sorry, the one that was, so, he's the one a, selling these devices in this app. Yes, and okay. this is this is why there's, there's going to be a whole arc to this. I figured we got time to kill since this was the last second thing we didn't. get <laughs> No, it's stuff. fine. It's fine. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. This is the guy that yeah. invented this thing who sells the app, and 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 it's also a standalone it's device, fun, isn't it? Well, back then it wasn't an app. It was okay, a just a standalone device. device. Kind of a big device. Yeah, it was, it was, this is before app world. Um, so I was like, but he was, but what what struck me about it is that he, he was like, it's a magic eight ball. It was it was a it was a ruse on Frank, and I can respect that. Sure. But it, and then he tells a story which really started. This started happening. He was like, oh, what the hell is this? And that's what made him continue to develop it and whatnot. So I'm like, eh, whatever. So. Fast forward to Stanley Hotel. Remember Adam Bly? Of course I do. Scariest mother effort I've ever he is, been around. He's an exorcist. He's he's was he ordained by the Catholic Church? I don't remember. He had a relationship with the Catholic Church. I know that. Yeah, if I remember correctly, he he was on their payroll somehow, and he educated priests. He helped priests learn how to do exorcists. I mean, he 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 did real stuff. He went around the world for them. I don't know exactly how that all worked, but uh, or how much I'm allowed to say. So right, but uh, um. So I'm at the Stanley Hotel, and I'm in the Stephen King room, which is 217. And Adam was actually running an area. It was one of the first times I, I talked him into running an area for this event. And he was across the way in the admin building. And we had a, we had a spirit box going, and we had a ovulus going. And it was one of the ovuluses that would actually say the word, not just print it out. Right. And the ovulus in the spirit box in front of a group of like 30 people that were in this room with me. This is on video somewhere. The, the spirit box started talking to the ovulus and the ovulus started talking back to the spirit box. And it was saying, literally, the ovulus was saying, can I cuss because it's part of the story? It was saying F Adam Bly, F Adam. The spirit box said F Adam Bly, where is he? Kill Adam Bly. And then the, spirit, the ovulus started going, kill, kill, kill. And then it was insane. So I started texting Adam Bly. Uh, dude, there's something over here talking about killing. People are freaking out in the room. Oh, my God, what's it doing? And then there's a set of uh, big, long set of chest, chest, not a chest of drawers. That's a long one, right? The tall one. Chest. It was the dresser. It was a dresser. And if 
Hey, this is important. <laughs> okay. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm standing with my back to it, right? And and all of a sudden, the girl next to me screams bloody murder because the drawer opened up and hit her in the back of the arm. Huh. While all this is going down, I'm like, what the, what is going on? I'm technically like, dude, what the hell's going on? You know, this thing's cussing you out, wanting to kill you. This door o- drawer opens, hits this lady in the back of the arm. She screams bloody murder. And I go to close the drawer. And you know how some drawers are like really easy on rollers, you know, yeah, right. slide mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. This, was, this was not one of those, one of the original ones where you had to like kick the damn door, drawer in. Right, it was it wood sliding on wood. So it was wood sliding on yeah, wood. It was, it was a lot brutal. of friction. Yep. Yeah. So, so. It has, we push that back. What the hell is going on? And all of a sudden, it just goes crickets. Everything shut up. Everything stopped. And on the door, of what the? And I, it's Adam. He walked over, <laughs> and it just went crickets. It's like what the hell? And he kind of walked in, and people were going, "Oh my god, it was saying this. It was saying that. Oh my god!" Da, 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 da. And he's like, "I'm gonna do an experiment. I'll be right back." And he shut the door and he disappeared. And all of a sudden, it started up again. F him, F him, get him out of here, screw him. It was Adam this, Adam, it was insane. And then it went crickets again. And right about that time, it was time to rotate the group, so they had to go. And Adam walked in as they walked out. So now we're in the room alone. I'm just at, He goes, yeah, I walked the other end of this hallway to see what would happen. And I thought, well, it came back. So he goes pulls out this peach paper thing and opens it up and he's standing over the spirit box and he's blah, 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 blah. he's doing a mini mini exorcism at the oh time God. he didn't know this yeah he's doing this little mini exorcism. and you're sitting there and this is the first- <laughs> i was sitting on the bed just waiting for the next group because yeah. I'm, I'm tired because i'm mentally exhausted and he's doing this thing and then right below the peach paper where the where the spirit box is like you all said, of a sudden you I keep saying the- peach do you mean parchment Parchment, thank you. Okay. Parchment paper. Gotcha. Yeah, that. Yeah, like the old school paper. Yep. Um, right below it, this ball of blackness about the size of a cat just materializes, hits the ground, shoots into the bathroom, and and the soaps that were on the sink counter went bouncing around the entire side of that. If my ass had feet, I would have backed right out the window and dropped the two floors down and taken off. But I did this like big eye thing and Adam literally stops and looks at me and goes, did you see that? And I was like, what the was it? Yeah. What was that? And, and he literally looks, he literally says, you were meant to see that. Blah, 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 blah. It starts, goes back to his thing. Oh my God. At that point, at that point, and, and if this was not in front of 30 people that I could talk to about, I would think I was batshit crazy on drugs, on peyote. I hallucinated something, but it's on video. It's on audio and 30 people witnessed it. Well, what was that all about? Yeah, yeah. And, and the ovulus did something, and the spirit box did something. So, what do I do with that? Yeah. Well, what do I do? Because I, I am. Um, I think. I think at some point, uh, you and I are going to have to do some field study with these pieces of equipment and see if we can get some things to happen. I think that would be a great live stream. And uh, you know, yeah. kind of test. Don't you think that'd be a lot of fun? Yeah. Um, you know. But again, but what? But but is it? Is it the location? Does the weather have to be right? Was it because Adam was there and what he does in the world of the Catholic Catholic stuff? Um, I mean, does it? Does everything have to line up right? I mean, can just you and I go out and find some place and do this? I don't know. Yeah, well, because it true. doesn't happen that often. No, you're right. It doesn't. It doesn't. But we can certainly give it a shot. Um, I want to ask you about the state of. Uh, paranormal reality television now uh, obviously ghost hunters w- ran for what uh, 12 seasons how many seasons was it i don't remember it, it did 11 and got axed and then came back in this new form over on a okay so it was 11 and then it came back is it still on anymore i don't even know uh, i with the pandemic who the hell knows what yeah. shows on and, yeah. and coming back or not coming back. I, I know that kindred spirits is filming i saw that ghost nation might be going back out um yeah i, I, I haven't seen anything on ghost hunters uh and then and then then the whole ghost adventures thing that's a little weird in itself too i don't know what they're up to but what do you think about the state of paranormal reality television now a you know have has everything been done that that can be done or you know what do you think i mean how many different ways can you look for a ghost you know what i mean Um, i know exactly what you're saying yeah yeah, yeah, everybody's looking for their unique angle, but it is what it is. Ghost, ghost investigating is 
ghost investigating. You've got some equipment. You go into a room. You talk to yourself. Hopefully, you get something. I mean, how many different ways can you change? I mean, everybody's got high tech equipment, low tech equipment, everything in between. I mean, so. But my my problem is is that is that Hollywood wants to make a quick buck, and so many people will just want to be on TV. That they'll do whatever to be on TV. Yo, you want, oh, I saw something. Oh, what to do? I mean, that was the one thing about Ghost Hunters is that we were never asked to cheat. We were never, at, never, never once was I asked to flub something or right. make something up. Or now it doesn't mean we didn't get some stuff wrong because of the nature of the show and how fast we had to move. But right. um, there was no active uh, cheating group or or, or uh, evidence making group. Um, and honestly, I think that's what made Ghost Hunters what it was. All right, so let, remember the first season. Let, let me oh, – go ahead. What about the first season? The, it was 13 episodes, and yeah. only three of them had activity. That's you right. Know? That's right. But that was so you fresh know, and so new. It. Yeah. But um, let yeah. me ask you about – there's some controversial – uh, moments in Ghost Hunters, particularly in a couple of those Halloween specials. You know what I'm talking about. Um, what are your thoughts on those? Or what, how do you react when people bring them up, like me right now? Uh, oh, um, well, if you were there, I would be really questioning it, but you weren't there. So. <laughs> yeah, I was there. I just wasn't in that, in that part of the building. I was out in the trailer. Oh, man. Um, are we talking about the jacket pool? Or what are we yeah, that's about? one. That's one for sure. Yeah, I, 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 okay, I wasn't there, but I can tell you this. I worked around Grant for years and years and years and years and years and years and years, seven, eight to be exact. I never once, never once saw him do anything funky. Right. Anything that made me go, hmm, never once. So that's all I got to go off of is that my, my experience with Grant and knowing Grant is that it is what it is. It's legit. If he says it's legit, it's legit. Now, if you can, if you can produce some evidence, some hard evidence, not the shit that they had on the, on the, uh, you know, all these people. Well, if you did this and you did that, and the stars aligned just right, yeah, I know, four or five's coming. Um, <laughs> all right, this <laughs> is a PG thirteen uh, episode tonight. Just so you're aware, yeah, should have said that in the beginning of the show. Yeah, sorry, um, but the, yeah, I, I don't. Can stuff be faked? Absolutely. What? Well, not not what I experienced. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and we didn't have to. That was the beautiful thing about Ghost Hunters. We didn't have to fake anything. The brilliance of Rob Katz at the time was get off your ass and investigate it. I don't care if you know what it is. Get off your ass. I cannot tell you how many haunted ice machines I found. <laughs> and I and I knew when I heard the sound. Yeah. That it was going to be an ice machine. Yeah. But Rob Katz was stri- – if you hear it, get up and move. What was that? Did you hear that, KG? What was that? Man, it came from that room. Let's go check it out. And But that gave the suspense for the people watching. And at the end, if it was a haunted ice machine, that's what they showed it was. But it was a nice little segment for people to get excited over. Well, some of the best episodes and, but, turned but, out to be you know, debunked uh, or, or the, the activity was debunked or in the case of what the, the Mossback or whatever the – the winery there. Um, oh yeah, yeah, the one that had all the the fun. Yeah, all the uh, all the stuff in the walls and all the, trying to you know pull one over yeah. on everybody. Yeah, I mean it's, that was one of the best episodes ever, and it was it was because they proved it was all a bunch of uh, you know fraudulent. Uh, uh, hooey. Yeah, it was hooey for sure. Yeah, but I will tell you this, JV. I cannot tell you how many times. Something happened, and KJ and I looked at each other. Amy and I looked at each other, and we thought we knew exactly what it was. But because of the because of cats, get up and investigate. Yeah. And holy crap, some of the best evidence I've caught was because of that. Yeah. That I never would have got up for because I thought I knew what it was. There was so, there was one there was uh, let me let me just ask you this. there's one episode um, and I don't remember which one it was and I'm pretty sure you were involved in the investigation where there was a door closing caught on. On uh, on video on, and it's part of the evidence, and uh, uh, people have kind of looked at that very very closely and have said that you can see a hand on it closing the door. I've got two points of that. First of all, do you know anything about that? But secondly, um, 
it's is it possible like in the case of the queen mary investigation where somebody manipulated the videotape which was discovered later uh is it possible that on more than one occasion maybe the owners of the place or you know some some people who just want to uh, you know i don't know fool, try to fool the team uh could have uh, been involved in some of those things and they just you know weren't caught specifically so it is it possible? Yeah, anything's possible. If someone's if someone's dead set on making sure that something happens in there, and that they use fore planning and forethought, but we look for that stuff. Right. I mean, we do our best to, to look for it. The crew. I mean, there's 13 crew. There was seven, six, seven, eight team members, and we're all watching for that kind of stuff to make sure nothing's going on. Um, uh, but is it possible? Yeah, anything's possible, but. Did it happen a lot or at all? Not that I know of, not that I ever saw. I, I did hear one story uh, early on, and this is before I was on the show, but there was a producer that had ju was just assigned to the show, and he had been around you know, doing all these reality shows, so to him it was just another fucking job. And a lot of these crew guys, they come to the show, they don't realize how boring it is. <laughs> it is boring. boring. It is so boring. <laughs> so I mean, boring. when you see a half um, hour or a sh a, a investigation, you see, you know, some some things happening here and there that, you know, that took like, you know, 15 hours of, of sitting there for nothing, you know, with nothing going on yeah. before that stuff happened. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, nothing. Um, and, and this producer threw a rock to make something happen. And. and he got somehow he got caught. I don't know if it was because he was on the DVR camera, but he got caught doing that. They fired him like literally as soon as, as soon as that was seen. I, yeah. I, I'm assuming Jay got to Jay or whatever, and Jay, done. He was gone. Yeah. So there was no messing around with that. I mean, it, it, you just didn't do that on because Jay and Grant were like, no, that's not what this is about. And the beautiful thing about it was the executive producer was on board with it because some of our best episodes, our most intense episodes, were. It had very little evidence happen. That's right. But if you get up and investigate, what was that? Did you hear that? What was that? Let's go investigate. You know, you can – enough strange shit happen to make great episodes even if it wasn't paranormal. Sorry. Um, um, so – and plus, Craig Pelagian was cheap. He would not – he would not spend for special effects. <laughs> He didn't even want Mike Rowe doing the voiceover because he was expensive. That's so funny. Uh, you, um, you know, I, Grant is a great guy. I like Grant a lot. I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. But I didn't think the revival of Ghost Hunters uh, uh, carried on the tradition of Ghost Hunters and the quality of Ghost Hunters. I just didn't feel it did the job. I don't know if that's because it was, well, you know, where it was. I don't know if that's what, it, what. but I was disappointed. You know, it's tough. It's tough. I mean... Ghost Hunters was on for how long with the same core team of Jay Grant, Dave, Steve, you know, um, you know, it's just, it's just tough when you're bringing a whole new crew, a whole new team and none of them have ever look investigating the paranormal is one thing. Investigating paranormal on TV is a whole nother animal and you got to be able to blend. You got to be able to articulate out, what you are feeling at the time. That's what was hard for me the first couple of episodes. And then I had to, because I live in LA, I had to go to Hollywood where the production studio is and do some voiceover stuff. And the editors got a hold of me and sucked me into their bay. And they said, look at this, look at this, look at this. And they really educated me on how to articulate across what I'm feeling. And what I learned was you have to talk everything out. I mean, literally Amy and I, because we were investigating together before the show was even on the air. I mean, we knew each other quite well, and we, right. we could literally investigate maybe say three words, and we knew exactly what we were doing and exactly what we were experiencing. But how boring is that for the crowd, for the people watching? So investigating the parent, you got to articulate, you got to talk everything out. And I like to talk a lot because I like the sound of my voice. So it was a natural for me. Yeah, you talk a lot and you talk very fast. So you can get a lot of words out in yeah. a short amount of time. It's good. Yeah, yeah, I got to because you'll shut me up and <laughs> I, cut me off. <laughs> it's true. Well, I've done it more than once. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you also gotta, you know, and there's just there's other stuff, and it, it, and if you have people that, it, let me back up. There is an art form to doing it, 
and a knowledge. And, you know, as like KJ and I, when we were, when we were working together, we knew the camera guy was one camera guy, two people. So he's got to follow both of us. And when the camera's on me, I'm going to talk. And then he's going to come back to KJ. And I know to stop talking and let KJ say, ask a question. And then he's going to come back. And, or if we're focusing on, on something to make sure that I stand in a position where the camera guy can get a shot of it. Now, is that, you know, is that helping them make the show? Yeah. Cause if they can't get the shot, the audience can't see it. And if the audience can't see it, they're not going to watch. And then you have no ratings and then you get yeah. canceled and you have no job. Right. So there's a weird dance you got to do there. But also just – so what happened was everybody's used to watching Ghost Hunters, which was the A-team. But everybody there has been doing it a long time. And they knew exactly how to do it. And they're watching the A-team. And they're, and then, boom, two-year hiatus. was a two-year hiatus, although the repeats kept going. But they're two-year – and then they came back with a completely new crew that's never been on TV before. Right. Boom. Yeah. And you expect them to be as fluid and as as the A team? No. Yeah. Well, it doesn't it just doesn't work that way. And that's why it was so cuz I watched the first couple episodes and then I was done. It was so clunky and and it's not their fault. They 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 just weren't I, I, well, the, the funny thing is, is, I think Grant made a miscalculation there, and I was talking with him before the first show aired, and he's he was so excited. He said it's all whole new team, all new perspectives, all new you know faces, all new ideas, all new technique, whatever. Um, and I think he didn't calculate on calculate the fact, as you just articulated, that all new means you know a little untried, a little untrue, a little unpracticed. And I think yeah. that's what they got. I couldn't watch it. I watched. I, I think I watched the first one of the rema or the relaunch, and that was all I could handle. I couldn't watch it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Again, those people they were just I, they were just running the deep end. And but there's also the high is. If that team was the original team that started that a, a brand new show, probably wouldn't you wouldn't have noticed as hard or wouldn't have been a big deal. If that I, actually, was the original I, team, back let, let, let me let me back you up. I don't I don't think you know having new people was the problem so much as not having a new approach. One of the things that bothered me about the show is that everything you know they're sitting there oh i have this feeling oh i'm feeling i have feeling uh i'm, I'm getting tingly i get this feeling and it was all about these feelings and uh you know little less reliance on on visual or equipment or and not that i need equipment but it wasn't as scientific i guess is the point right. it was more yeah. you know oh, I, and they had a, i think they had a didn't they have a, a medium on the on the program too and you know they were seeing all these okay. it's just, it was just all it was all the same old, same old. And I don't mean the same old in the terms of the old Ghost Hunters, because that the old Ghost Hunters was not the same old. This was the same old, you know, uh, subjective approach to ghost hunting. And I just didn't, it, uh, it didn't do it for me. And maybe other people liked yeah, it. Need, I just didn't do it for me. You need to have the equipment to back up the feelings and tinglies and all that stuff if you're going to do it. But you know what? I have a piece of evidence here. Oh, okay. Yeah. See if this, we'll see if, we'll see if this one works. Um, Oh, I'm lying to you. You don't um, have one? No, I, I do. I, I just didn't I didn't grab it, so I'm going to grab it real quick. Okay. Talk, so basically, this, this is an investigation, and this lady is feeling like something is grabbing her, touching her head and whatnot, and her husband was smart enough to, um, to turn the camera on her, and you could actually see the hair being pulled down. So if you're going to do the, the feels, the, I, I have the feels, I feel this, I feel that. You got to somehow be able to document. This guy was lucky to document it with his camera. Um, and if I remember correctly, their K2 was going off also. And I'm looking for it as we speak. Help me, JV. Run your mouth, please. Okay. I, I thought you had it right there <laughs> ready to go. I was trying not to be in the way. <laughs> Found it. Oh, Found there you go. Okay. See how good you are? Yeah. It's, it's coming up. Oh, my God. Someone shoot me now. Just kidding. Brick Griffith, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. Now if I, can you hear audio at all? No, not really. Okay, so she, right now, she's, she her hair is being pulled, and she's like, now she's fluffing it, and then and then just watch the top of her head. He asks, "Are you touching Rose?" Keep watching her head. Right there, see that? Yeah, definitely. I'll back it up. Yeah. Uh, so if you're going to have the – like, a, a, I'm sorry. I, I hear the audio, so it makes me not want to talk. 
and then boom, the hair gets moved. Yep. So that was Rose, by the way. Um, so how many times have, we, have people said, oh, I feel something touching me. I feel something touching my hair. I feel something. She got she got lucky because had she just said, I felt like something was touching my hair, it would just be a story. Right. But because they had the equipment and the camera caught it, it makes it a much a much more profound, great piece of evidence. Um, and that that's what I feel like some a lot of these ghost shows have gotten away from. Because to be honest with you, all the equipment I used to do on Ghost Hunters was difficult for the editors. Because you have to get all these shots. And unfortunately, the camera guy can't get them all. Right. Um, while we're seen, because we have to move along, and then they try to go back the next day and set equipment up and get their get their they, they, the B shots they call it the cutaway of the piece of equipment. So, you know, and that was one of the things I learned in, in the editing bay by by the editors showing me all this stuff. So I started shooting myself while I I don't know if you ever if you watch the show like after the couple seasons I'm in, you'll notice I'm always carrying a camera and I'm always filming myself put stuff down. Right. And that was to help the editors tell the story. So that the camera guy didn't have to remember everything. But having all that equipment is difficult. So a lot of shows want to cut corners. Well, that's that's a pain in the ass. We don't want all that stuff. Just just talk about your feelings. Yeah. We'll get two seasons out of this and we're on to the next. What do we care? Don't say on to the next. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um so but so, so, so back to what you're saying, the equipment makes things tougher for for the editing part of it and and whatnot but and, and it also makes it tougher to investigate because you got to set it all up you got to pay attention to it you got to make sure you have a camera on to document it if something happens and you know that's work i am a workaholic so i enjoyed it one of the last episodes i did i did with joe chin it was uh the two uh, i think it was a 200th episode and we were in the kitchen thing downstairs whatever i put out 72 pieces of equipment wow in one room area. Joe was so baffled by it. But we got great evidence. We got to watch something walk across the room. Yeah. Uh, when you um, would review, do the evidence review uh, after the after the investigation itself, uh, how tedious was that? Oh, my God. My eyes bled. <laughs> my ears bled. <laughs> so, you know, Jay was all about putting stationary audio with all the cameras which I'm not a big fan of because I had to listen to it. And when you're listening to a static for six and a half hours straight, yeah, it's brutal. But the other thing that was brutal is Jay, when he would see a stationary audio is he would walk by it and walk up to it and go. And bang that. Did you hear that? Yeah. That loud. Bang. He would bang right next to it. So, you'd be listening to silence. So you'd have it turned all the way up and he would sneak in <laughs> and slap the fucking thing. Oh, you just went way over the oh. line right there. Oh, sorry. Ay, ay, ay. Oh, you have to edit that out. Bleep that. But he would slap it. So you always had that to worry about. Um, but no, it was the, and we, and we, the team, we, the team reviewed all of our own stuff, which is why I was stuck on the road 300 days out of the year. Did you, was, did you review your own stuff or did you have, did you review one of the other investigators and they reviewed yours? It was, it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, just by chance, basically at the end of the night. So that show was shot on tape. It wasn't digital yet. I mean, it was digital tape, but it wasn't digital cards. Um, so production dubbed everything. Apparently, in the beginning, they had a mishap once, and some tapes went missing because some ex-member lost some stuff. <laughs> I wonder who you could be talking about right now. Uh, Hornwall. I mean, um, yeah, I, I was told it was Brian Hornwall, but uh, well, every, every, Brian, so now, you know, the funny thing is, is Brian became the scapegoat for everything, and I know he deserved a lot of it. I know that's true, uh, but I think that you know, anytime anything went wrong, oh, that was Brian. That was Brian. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but no, so, so production would make dubs of everything. So the camera guy would be shooting and doing his stuff and we would be viewing our cameras and stuff. And as soon as we get done for that investigative area, we would, when we go back to where crafty was at, we would turn our tapes into production and they would make a dub of it. And then basically at the end of the night, uh, when Steve was the equipment manager, Steve would get all the tapes and then he would divide them all and the recorders. And then we would all, uh, most of the time it was the next morning. We would all get 
a box of evidence to review. And sometimes it was your stuff. Sometimes it wasn't. If you, if there was something that you really wanted, you could ask for your tape. Mm -hmm. um, if there's something you really needed to dig out and whatnot. So, but it was hit or miss if you got your stuff or not. Um, it was really weird watching myself the first couple of times. But, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, any, any funny story you want to share, share with us before we wind this up tonight? Um, I'm, by the way, I have um, to say it's funny. really weird interviewing you. It's really a strange, I I, strange thing for me. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I mean, I mean, I guess I could ask you some stuff. Uh, mean, it's not you as were weird. at the Stanley or the, yeah. the baseball hall of fame. Oh my god, the baseball hall of fame. I totally forgot about that one. Yeah, that was, that fun. was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Oh, Jay was so pissed that we did that investigation. Oh, because he hates baseball. And <laughs> the, the, and uh, the the field producers loved baseball, like like they drank blood, sweat, yeah. baseball, knew everything. Yeah. <clears throat> I hated doing that one, but those guys had a blast. I had a blast. Um, that was a good. That was a good episode. That was a good investigation. That was a cool place. Yeah. Anyway, um, sorry, a little going down memory lane there in my head. Um, were you there for that filming yeah, that night? Of course, I was. Yeah, we did the we did the. Um, Hall of Fame, and we also did uh, Hyde Hall, which is a, an old mansion in the Cooperstown area. Oh, that's right, Hyde Hall. I forgot. That's where we got that crazy mist. Yep. Yeah, we never did the Otisaga, did we? Not on, we not as an episode. Yeah. Well, we did it. We did an event there. Oh no, no, that's no. Right. We no, we did. We did an episode at the Otisaga. Yeah, we did. Absolutely. Thought, yep. Yeah, I thought we did. Yeah, we yeah. absolutely did. Yes. Yeah. It was it was Otisaga, Hyde Hall, and uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. Yep. Wow. God, how it all bleeds together. I know. Uh, I mean, funny story. I mean, we're always practical joking each other and throwing snowballs at each other in the snow. And um, there was a t there was a run there that it was all about the stink bombs. So someone bought those little glass stink uh, stink bomb things, and we would put them underneath the floor mat in the, in the, in the vehicle. So when you get in, you'd be doing the <laughs> gas, you'd crack it, and then it would, <laughs> it would uh, stink. Um Oh my God! Uh, Vaseline on the hotel door handles. Um, yeah, there was a lot of practical jokes that went down. Um, and then there was some cool time. There was some cool stuff. Yeah, one of the things. Yeah. One of the things that's fun is even before you were on the show, and we were all, we'd all be hanging out. And uh, uh, Jason used to have a way of making you do some of the craziest crap, like. Like didn't oh, didn't you like yes. like chase down a bull one time or something? What, 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 I'm trying to remember. You jumped up. That would be. No, it was it was uh it was up at the Stanley Hotel. Was it what, the elk? Was it the elk that were up there? The, I chased an elk. There was that, but there was, was one where you went off into a field, like went out, jumped the fence. I'm trying to remember. I can't I can't come up with it again because they all blend <laughs> into each other. But wow. Oh wait, no, no, you're right. That it was a it was a, it was a cow. It wasn't a bull. Oh, it was a cow. Um, but okay. he. He dared, he dared me to go touch the forehead of a cow. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. You used to do all this shit. Or you had to eat the hot sauce or you drank what you did. You did some. Uh, no, that was. And you ended up throwing up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah wow. that was, that was bad. That was rough. Oh shit. When, oh, shoot. When we did that, uh, when we did that, uh, <laughs> what was the one with the, uh, it was in, uh, New York, the, the, the theme park when they stuck KJ and I on that whirly machine that went around the, uh, the teacups, yeah, the tea. because the, the teacup, and then Jay wouldn't let the guy stop it, yeah. and he ran KJ for like 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, God, I threw up so hard. I hate being dizzy with a passion. Oh. Man, I, and then I started throwing up, and the sound guy could hear it because I had the mic on. Oh, God. And instead of feeling bad for me, he gets on the radio, Briss Ralph and Briss Ralph, and here come all the camera guys to film it. <laughs> Oh, man. Hey, listen, let me just mention this. If you're new to the show here tonight, um, please subscribe, whether you're on YouTube. I know we have some people on Twitch as well. Please subscribe to the program. I'd appreciate it. Uh, we don't always have this much laughter on the show, but it's been a really, really uh, fun night, Britt. I'm, I'm glad uh, you were available to do this. 
Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.